Welcome. Thanks for being with us today. You know, we understand the importance of gathering together in whatever circumstances we have, even if it's just online. The gathering together of worship, of being in the Word, a prayer together, all of it matters. And we're really thankful that you're here with us. If this is your first time with us, we want to give you a special welcome and let you know that we'd love to be able to connect with you. You could simply click on the link that's on the website, or you can go to the chat room window and click on it there, or simply text the number in that you see on the screen. You know, we're coming up on a full month now staying at home, and we know that many of you could be simply suffering from isolation or trying to put 24 hours together for your kids or used to being gone at school, or maybe you're even struggling through the furlough of a job or a complete loss of a job. We want you to know that we're with you, that we care about you and right where you're at. We're staying in contact with our local health authorities to know exactly how we can move forward and when we can move forward to gather together again. Until then, we want you to know that we're going to be online with our services and our dailies. We'll be sending out email with information of what's going on and that we'll be making calls. You know, we care about you. We want you to know uh, that we want you to know that we're here for you. That if you have any needs at all, that we can help in some way, we're calling through the body right now to make sure that you know that the church is here. You know, in the meantime, God has been doing some great things through you. You know, because of your charitable giving, we've been able to step up and really help people in our community, in the church, and even around the world. You know, we've been able to help people with rent, mortgage, utility payments, with food, lots of different ways, and it's all come because you've been generous and faithful to the Lord. Your generosity has made it possible for us to supply Foothills Food Bank and for Phoenix Rescue Mission. But we want so much more. We believe God wants us to use us in bigger ways. We're not done. Our ministry partner, Convoy of Hope, has come to us and asked us to come alongside of them in the process to feed 10 million meals to people that are in need. This week, the elder board at Highlands Church has voted unanimously to provide $100,000 to Convoy of Hope to provide food and supplies to people. That's three entire semis of food and supplies that are going be going out to people that really need the help. And so we want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your faithfulness. And we want you to know that we're not done yet. Through this whole coronavirus experience, God is opening up the door for us to minister to more people. And as he opens up the door and provides the ability to do that, we're going to step in and meet those needs. If you're a part of our own body, we want you to know that we're here to help you as well. If you need help, please go to the website where it says need help and click on that. We'll contact you. If you can help, if God has put you in a season of prosperity, please give. Your giving makes it possible for us to come alongside people and to help them in this time. Right now, we want to spend a little time in worship. We want to worship God for who He is and for what He's done. And so Brendan and the worship team are going to be leading us in a brand new song. Thanks, Bob. And hello, church. We are so excited to sing a new song with you today. And we love the message of this song for the season that we're living through right now. The song is called, There's Nothing That Our God Can't Do. And now more than ever, there are so many things in our life that we don't have control over. And when we don't have control, we can get anxious. But the good news is that we worship a God who is in complete control of all things, all the time. When the situation around us looks hard or even impossible, we remember that God is capable of anything. And because He loves us, we know that what God does will ultimately be for our good, even if we can't see it right away. Isaiah 14, 27 says, For the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart Him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Or uh, Psalm 33, 11 says, The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. There's nothing that our God can't do to make a way through every challenge and every season. Now, the worship team has joined me in recording at home again this week, so let's all sing together. Here we go. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. 
Oh, just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that a God can do There's not a mountain that He can't move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do In just one word You heal what's broken inside me In just one word And you revive every dream In just one time Just one touch, my eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that a God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that a God can't do. It's not a prison wall that can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that I got can do. Oh, I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like this power There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can't move Oh, praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that I got can't do. Oh, I know there's nothing that I got can't do. There's not a prison wall that can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that I got. Hey, Highlands, good morning. We're here with Craig and Catherine Hyatt, and they're part of our small group ministry. Wanted to talk with them just briefly this morning to talk about their experience with small groups and how they're having a chance to do that even during this period of social distancing. So, Craig, uh, Catherine, first tell us a little bit about how you got connected to Highlands and especially into the small group ministries. Well, we searched and searched high and low for a church, and we came upon Highlands, and the first time we we came to Highlands, we knew we were at home. Yeah, great. I, I think about small groups where something I've never done up until I came to Highlands, Mark, and never did anything like that with Catherine, even her spiritual life before. And, and I just now have come to realize, what a, what a, how have I missed out so much? And just being with other brothers and sisters of like kind people, just seeking what Jesus and what God wants for us as, as couples and as individuals. Mm -hmm. and, and I just think about the, these are our new best friends after we moved to a new community. It, it you know, we're, we pray together, um, our, we share our problems together, and um, I've never had a group of couples that we did that with. And 
And it's just such a support system. And I, it actually made me feel connected. And it's, it's been a blessing. You know, uh, I know some of the people in your group, and I know that besides all those spiritual benefits, you're also having another element, which is the fun element. It's quite humorous. It really well, it's is. seeing people in their living room and what they're wearing yeah. or not wearing. <laughs> and uh, their dogs. And, and I get the brunt of most of it because um, my hair grows a little bit more crazier <laughs> these times, Mark. And, um, but, uh, yeah, I just think that it, it just it, it, it's humanizing. It, it, it's making us start to be connected in somebody else's living room. Yeah. Catherine, Craig, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you continue to have fun and connect with those in your small group. And we'll see you later, hopefully soon, in person. Thank Peace. You. Take care. <laughs> We've got another great couple that are also doing that. I want to introduce Chris and Stephanie Kern to everybody. Hi. How are you? Good to be here. You know, it's not social isolation. It's social distancing. Right. So you're still finding that sense of community with your group. How have you found that to be over the last few weeks? We wanted to keep that. Now, that's an important part of our week was the small group and connecting with each other and especially in a time where, you know, nobody knows what's happening and what's going to happen next and how you'd handle this. Um, and we're all going it through together. Like we needed it. And it was, you know, the first week was like, great. It was a little awkward at first. Like everybody, you know, figured out how to use the app and the and video. where are they going to sit with the background? Yeah, all yeah. that. Yeah. But then it just, it was so good to see each other and to talk and say, connect them. Like, you know, how's it going at your house? What's happening with you? Um, because all of us, you know, the couples, we all have kids anywhere from um, pre-K through middle school. Yep. And so we were all kind of figuring it all out together. And, um, you know, it becomes, uh, it, it still is a highlight, highlight of our week. So what's the benefit of doing this um, online rather than having to drive somewhere? Well, obviously it's easier because you don't have to get ready for anything. And it takes less time because you're not having to rally the troops, get them in the car, get them where they're going. So I would encourage people that aren't in a small group, it's actually the easiest way to join. Uh, you guys have probably found your group to be just fun to be with. And if you've got Absolutely. gals calling you now, that's a testament mm -hmm. to the fact that you've made this a fun experience for them. You know, I know there was Thomas and we heard a couple couples talk about small groups in the home, which is something that we talked about, you know, after that, you know, logistics that, of it. Yeah, right. and like, what would that be like? And mm -hmm. we're now doing it. We're all doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's worked out really well. Like, what do you do with your kids during it? And it, it just works itself out. All of us, like some of our um, couples that are in our group, their kids join us. It's not a big deal. You know, they'll be there with us. Um, we're really flexible that way. So we all are in the same boat. We all have kids the same age. We all. Um, are going through the same things. Yeah. Like three weeks ago when this all started, um, one of the um, men in our group, uh, he's, his business is still working, but he had a woman who he works with who has a baby and um, couldn't find size five diapers anywhere. And so as part of our, you know, we, we always end with a prayer and, you know, how can, and we, help how can we help each other? Right. What can we do? He's like, right. hey, if anybody sees size five diapers out there, you know, I could use them and, and my, you know, this woman who works with me and could really use them. And so sure enough, like the next day, um, you know, we're, we're out and about and found size five diapers and we're able to get this woman who we've never met, don't know, but who was in need that, you know, has desperately, you know, we've had kids, so we know what it's like mm -hmm. to be low on diapers. Especially, yeah. Um, and so, you know, he was able to get them the diapers that, that they needed. You know, and that's the, that's the beauty of small groups. It, it provides the opportunity to, to be loved and love others. So. We've been able, and, every, and the group's been able to help everybody out. Yeah. So it's been great. Well, Highlands, the, the main message that we want to communicate is that um, we don't have to be isolated from one another. We can still um, have that sense of community. We have to do it through technology, but even though that might not be quite as good as having everybody in our living room, it's still a great experience, uh, even doing this with our, our computers or mobile devices. So if you haven't joined a small group, let me give you that invitation to do so even this week. We're going to be starting some brand new groups starting up this week. And um, in, in fact, Mary Beth and I are going to start a brand new group. So if you'd like to jump into that one or several that are going to be starting up, we'd love to give you that invitation. Just go online, click join a small group, and we'll take it from there. So Chris, Stephanie, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. And uh, have a great night tonight with your small group. Thanks, Mark. We Thanks appreciate you it. Too. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. But seek first, seek the, ki- first. But seek first. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. I'm really excited that we get an opportunity to return to the Sermon on the Mount. You know, we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount for quite a while now, haven't we? And the Sermon on the Mount, if you recall, is chapters 5, 6, and 7 in the Gospel of Matthew. And today, we're actually coming to chapter 7. So we're two-thirds of the way through this incredible message. Can you believe that we get to actually read the very words of Jesus Christ and the words that he preached to a multitude? It's a privilege, isn't it, that we've got the Word of God like we do, and we can see what Jesus had to say. You know, today's passage is going to quote a verse or reference a verse that I think is probably most known to everyone in the world, really, especially non-Christians. Now, we all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, even if he perishes, will have eternal life. So that's a really familiar verse, but the one that most people quote is found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Well, here, let me read it to you. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. We've all heard that, right? Matter of fact, the, the way that it's quoted, a lot of people would use the King James Version. Judge not lest ye be judged. Sounds kind of lofty, kind of a, a sense of superiority about it, right? Have you ever been judged by somebody? Do you know what that feels like? Maybe they give you a certain look, or they whisper under their breath to somebody next to you, and you can just tell they're criticizing you. There's something about you that they don't like, right? How's that make you feel? Makes you feel terrible. And and what do we want to do? We want to lash out and say, it's wrong for you to judge me. (laughs) Which Which is kind of ironic, because that statement itself is a statement of judgment, isn't it? Let me ask you another question. Have you judged anyone? Of course we have. Probably a better question would be, have you judged anyone today? You see, we judge people so much more than we should. We do it all the time. And what we're going to find out today is that Jesus says, don't. Stop. Stop criticizing people. Stop condemning people. Quit being harsh with those that you speak with. Just stop it. Stop judging. These are hard words to take, but man, they're so good for us to hear. Just last week, my wife and I were driving west on the 101. We were out driving out to Glendale to see my daughter, and we pulled off the access road, and we came to stop at 7th Street and Beardsley. And right there to the left, there's an underpass. And we saw a sign from a homeless person. I'm sure you all are familiar with people standing on the corners and they're holding up these signs and they're they're asking for money and and the sign will tell you what they're raising money for and what's our first reaction? We're thinking, yeah, right. I'm sure you're gonna use the money for that. What do we do? We judge. We make an appearance. We judge on their appearance and we think, there's no way that you're probably gonna use that money for what you say you're gonna do. Well, can I read you what the sign said? The person was gone, but the sign was left. And this is what it said. Thank you, Beardsley and 7th Street. Because of you, I made it to Texas for my mom's funeral. God bless you. Zing, right? I read that and instantly I felt convicted by the Holy Spirit. How many people have driven by that corner or been stopped at that light and turned to the left and they see somebody like that holding a sign. Well, this person probably faced hundreds of people every day and was wrongly judged. You see, what he was asking for was really what he needed the money for. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, the seriousness of judgment and what Jesus says to us about how we judge other people. But before we do that, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for our time together. Thank you for your word. 
Father, this is a passage that is difficult to read because it stings so much. But thank you that your word works like a scalpel and it cuts to our heart and does surgery within our spirit. I pray that as a result of this morning, that we would live differently because of the words of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our main idea for today, if I could summarize this whole message in one sentence, it would be this, is that Jesus takes judgment very seriously, really seriously, and that we need to examine our own lives first before we lovingly speak into the life of other people. Before we can express a concern outwardly to somebody, we need to take an inward look first. That's the message for today. I feel like this passage needs just a brief setup. What I'd like to do is, first of all, talk about the true judge, right? We all make judgments. We all take a position or a stance where we think we are the authority on another person's life. But you know what the reality is? Only Jesus Christ is the perfect judge. And that's because he is God, right? Only Jesus knows what's in the heart of men. Jesus knows all things. And so therefore, he is really the only one who is truly fit to judge. That's our first point. Jesus is the perfect judge, and he will judge everyone. Let me give you just a a couple verses from the New Testament. You know, the Apostle Paul was coming to the end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4. As he's writing to Timothy about passing the torch for Timothy to continue on in ministry, and Paul reflects upon his life, and he says these words, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. You see, Paul realizes that the Lord, and the Lord alone, is the righteous judge. Everything that Jesus does, everything that he says, every way that he thinks is perfectly righteous. And he alone is the perfect judge. An exciting passage of scripture is Revelation chapter 19. You see, Jesus is coming back someday. And the the 19th chapter of Revelation, we get a picture of that. Can you believe it? We actually see the coming of the Lord to the earth. And this is how it describes Jesus as he's coming back to judge. His judgments are true and just. In righteousness, he judges. There it is again, right? He alone is the true judge. Well, what do you mean? Well, one thing that's really significant is that as God, and as one who knows everything about everyone, he alone is able to look deep inside our hearts and see the secrets of our hearts. He alone knows the motives of people. Have you ever used this phrase where you say, you know what, I think I'm a pretty good judge of character. Really? Now, I know we use that phrase a lot, but really what it's saying is, I'm able to judge what I can't see. Can we really do that? Jesus can. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, It is the Lord who judges. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. See, only Jesus knows what's in the heart of man. He alone is the perfect judge. And so that provides us a little bit of a basis as we tear into this passage in the Gospel of Matthew. We need to remember Jesus is going to tell us not to judge. And one of the primary reasons for that is he alone is the perfect judge. So now that we understand who the true judge is, let's look at his teaching in the Gospel of Matthew. Hopefully you have your Bibles. I'm going to be reading starting in chapter 7. We're going to look at the first two verses. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. There it is. Don't judge. Why? Well, first of all, we know that he alone is the the true judge. And he says, don't judge because you will be judged. And we saw that 
the Apostle Paul tells us that all of us will stand before the Lord someday. And then there's a sober warning in here. He says, the measure or the standard by which you judge other people, you will also be judged according to that. See, we create this, this false standard of righteousness. We, we tend to think that maybe we have our lives more together than we really do. Maybe that we're more righteous, more godly than we really are. And so what we tend to do is we tend to impose the standard that we live by upon other people, right? And Jesus says, be careful, don't do that. Because that standard that you're judging other people by will be the standard by which I judge you. And we know that we are going to fall short. So don't judge. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're going to see within the context here, our first point is don't condemn other people. Don't condemn others. In other words, don't don't harshly criticize people. Don't look down upon people. You know, I tend to have a problem when I speak to my children at times. I I think I'm being loving and gracious and trying to offer a word of encouragement, maybe trying to correct a a thought that I feel maybe is is maybe the best way of thinking. And and I'll say something to my kids. Inevitably, I hear this from my wife. It's, It's, honey, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. See, I think I said it in a loving, gracious way, but whether it's my body language or my facial expressions, probably more the tone of my voice, it conveys a sense of judgment. And I can just tell when I speak those words, it deflates their spirit. And that's not what I want to do. I think I'm being helpful, but really what I'm doing is I seem to be condemning them. And this is the type of judgment that Jesus says we shouldn't do. Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, and that's us, right? For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here, right? Paul later says in Romans chapter 14, Why are you passing judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Jesus is saying, it's not your job to condemn. Stop harshly criticizing and judging other people. Because you will be judged in the same way. So that's our first point. Stop judging in this way. And now in verses 3 and 4, we're going to see an illustration to drive home the point. Let's look at chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. Jesus says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Verse 4, How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? Now, I know that Jesus is omniscient and he knows everything, but it's almost as if he's puzzled. He's saying, How can you do this? Why are you doing this? Why are you able to see such a small thing in somebody else's life when you have such a big issue in your own life? Why do you do that? How can you do that? And he uses an illustration here that I think is really insightful. He asks a couple questions, first of all, right? These questions are there to pierce a little bit, to get us to examine our own lives, to self-assess. But he uses a, a, a woodworking illustration. What do we know about Jesus Christ? Son of a carpenter. Do you think Jesus grew up in a wood shop watching his his father Joseph make things out of wood, work the saw, maybe chisel? Do you think Jesus ever got a splinter in his eye? And that's what the word speck means. It's a it's a splinter. I'm sure he did. Well, we know people, right? Uh, you've gotten a, a splinter or something in your eye. It feels like you have a scratch. You can tell when it's there. You might be looking at somebody and they're they're squinting, maybe their eyes starting to water. And so we can see it. That's what Jesus says. You can see the speck that is in your brother's eye. But Jesus is asking, why are you looking at that? What you should be concentrating on, giving all of your attention to, is the fact that you've got this massive beam of wood. The word log is like a giant beam, maybe one of the beams that would uphold the roof of a house or the main support beam 
in the structure of a home. And Jesus is saying, you're spending all of your time looking at a splinter. And the truth is, you're blinded by this log. Why are you doing that? How can you do that? What's ironic a little bit about this verse is, is it says that we are blind, and yet somehow we're able to see something in somebody else's life. You know, a couple weeks ago, I was at my grandchildren's home, and we had an Easter egg hunt. And we showed up at 7.30 in the morning. Man, they're up early, right? They can't wait to get started. When we walk out on the patio, my wife and I walk out, and the entire yard is just covered with pastel eggs. I mean, there must be over 100 eggs for these two little boys. And on the count of three, one, two, three, go. And what do they do? They just sprint. They take off. And they're in search of these eggs that are all the way across the yard. And you know what they're doing in the, <laughs> in, in the process? They're passing over the eggs that are right in front of them. I mean, they're everywhere. And I'm thinking, how can you not see this one? Just bend over. A couple of times we would grab their hand, we'd take them over to the tree fort, and we'd show them an egg, or we'd look, lift up the cover of the grill, oh, there was an egg hidden in there. See, they were all over, but for whatever reason, they were blinded to some of the most obvious things. Let me give you a different illustration. I would think that all of us have one of these in our refrigerators. Well, at least we think we do. As a, maybe that's just a guy thing. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. But how many times have I gone to the refrigerator and I'm looking for the ketchup, right? For whatever reason, it's kind of like socks in the dryer. Somehow you, they disappear. And I'm looking for this bottle of ketchup. And I might call off to my wife and say, honey, do we have any ketchup? And I hear this. Honey, it's on the door. <laughs> it's on the door, right? Well, I'm looking, but I don't see it. And it could be right in front of me. So I say, I don't see it. My wife will yell, it's right there in front of you. I still don't see it. So inevitably, she'll come out to the kitchen, pick it up, right there, it's right in front of you. <laughs> and she's right, but I can't see it. It's amazing, right? We miss the obvious. And Jesus' point here is saying, don't be the sin police. Don't play the role of the Holy Spirit in another person's life. Self-assess. That's our second point. Self-assess before giving love and correction. Why do we miss it? Why are we so blind? Maybe, maybe it's insecurity. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're afraid that if we admit that we have some of these same faults, that it'll make us look weak, less spiritual. Maybe we're trying to convey the sense that we really have our life together, our spiritual life is really vibrant. But if we're honest and we let people know some of the things we struggle with, it would paint us in a bad light. So it's a lot easier to look at other people than focus on ourselves. Maybe it's a, a hardness to sin. Maybe we are just calloused and we aren't sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's been a long period of time when we haven't been in the Word or been spending time in prayer and it seems like we're deaf to the Holy Spirit in our life. There are lots of reasons why we don't see the sin in our life. But man, it's so easy and and we're so quick to point it out in other people's lives. And Jesus says that's wrong. So what have we learned? Stop condemning. Don't condemn others. And we need to self-assess before we speak into the life of other people. If we don't, Jesus says we're hypocrites. Let's look at verse 5. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See, there's a process here. First do this, then do that. Well, what's the first step? You know, I'm sure we genuinely love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we might see something that we believe is harmful, that we want to point out, that we want to come alongside with love and grace and mercy and gentleness and help correct something that we feel they need to make right. But unless we look at our own life first, because that may be the same issue, the same sin problem that we're struggling with, Jesus says, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You know, there are two really good passages in Scripture, I think, that point this out. One is in the Old Testament, and one is in the New Testament. I'd like us to look at Psalm 51 first. You know, Psalm 51, if you know the context... It's David coming to grips with this sin. He got called out. 
And he realized that he had been calloused to the things of God and had been a hypocrite. See, David is king of Israel felt entitled to take whatever he wanted. And so he saw this woman named Bathsheba, and she was a married woman, but he saw her and he wanted her. And he ended up having a baby with her. So he committed adultery. And not only did he do that, he tried to fix it and and make things right, but he failed in that. So what does he do next? Well, he's the king and there's a war going on. So he commissions the woman's husband, to go to the front lines. And this man ends up getting killed. So not only does David commit adultery, but now he commits murder. And the prophet Nathan comes to him and he calls him out. And what we have in Psalm 51 is David dealing with his sin. See, he's going to look inward because that's what God wants us to do. Listen to what he says. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Now look at all these references to a sin. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil. He recognizes the evil aspect of his character. And then he says, I've done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. See, he recognizes that God alone is the righteous and the true judge. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. See, David is going deep into his soul. And he's looking inward and he's looking even at the the secrets of his heart that nobody else can see except the Lord. Then he says, purge me, wash me, blot out my iniquities, create in me, God, a clean heart. I want to fix this thing. And then in verse 13, he says these words, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. You see, the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit Oh God, you will not despise. You see what he did here? He recognized the fact, if I even want to go to somebody else with the concern that I have, maybe I see a sin in their life, the first thing I need to do is come clean in my own life. Only then do I have the opportunity to go to somebody else first. He did business with God first. Paul says the same thing in in Galatians chapter 6. He's talking to the church there. And in chapter 6, the first three verses, Paul writes this. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. See, that's how we're supposed to go to a brother or sister in Christ. If we are really, truly spiritually mature, godly people... When we see a brother and sister who's caught up in a transgression, it should grieve us. We should want to go to them with the spirit of mercy and grace and gentleness. See, that's true spirituality. But then Paul says this, Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, He deceives himself. You see what he says? If you're going to go to a brother or a sister in Christ and point out something you think needs to be corrected, do a gut check, right? He says, keep watch on yourself because we might be prone to the same temptation, the same sin. We might have the same sin in our life. So how can we go to somebody else when that is the same issue for us? Jesus says if we do that, If we don't self-assess before we lovingly go to another brother and sister in Christ, it says we're hypocrites. And Paul's warning us, don't do that. Don't do that. You see, Jesus is the only true judge. It's not our role to condemn, to criticize. And if we see a brother and sister in Christ, what are we supposed to do? Look inward first. Self-assess our own sin. And only then can we go and lovingly speak into the life of somebody else. 
Well, let's look how Jesus wraps up this passage. Verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now, this seems like an odd place to put a sentence like this, right? Does it fit? Well, yes, it does. What have we been talking about? We're talking about sin in the life of an individual. And we all recognize that we're sinners. But praise the Lord, Jesus Christ has freed us from our sin. He has set us free. He's forgiven us. And we recognize that a loving thing to do is in a spirit of humility, we might have occasion and a need to go to a brother and sister in Christ. That's the gospel. Celebrating the forgiveness of Christ and and what he wants for us. But you realize, as we love people, we may take the gospel the message of forgiveness of sins to people who don't know the Lord. And what might be their response? Total rejection. Animosity. That's what we see here. See, inevitably, if we try to share the gospel, the fact that Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins, and the fact that he rose again three days later from the grave to give eternal life, that's the gospel. When we point out that people can be saved from their sin, they probably miss the saving part, and feel that what we've done is we've just highlighted their sin. And they don't like that. They sense that that's condemnation. And Jesus says, don't give to dogs what is holy or throw your pearls before the pigs. You know, the dogs and the pigs in Scripture, these are metaphors for unbelievers. In Revelation chapter 22, when it's talking about the kingdom of heaven, it says that the dogs are on the outside. So they're not believers They're not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. You know, I've been to Haiti and and several of you have probably been to third world countries. When you see dogs running the streets in any other place besides America, you're probably not going to go up and pet them. They're scavengers. They're digging in the garbage. Most of the world would look upon dogs as filthy and dirty, not pets. And here we have an example. Dogs might have been taking some of the meat that was sacrificed to the Lord, some of the leftovers, or maybe they take some of the holy bread. It says, don't do that. Don't give that to them. They don't want it. They'll reject it. They're not worthy of it is what he is saying. And the pigs, don't throw them the pearls. You know, Matthew chapter 13, the the kingdom of heaven is described as the great pearl, the value, the value the joy and the treasure of eternal life and the message of the kingdom. When you bring that message, some people act like pigs and they reject it. They trample it underfoot. So the truth here that we need to point out, the principle is that we as believers need to use discernment and stay on mission. When you share the gospel and someone's confronted with their sin and they don't know Jesus They take great offense. And not only do they reject the gospel, but they attack us. Have you felt that? Have you been in a situation where people have verbally attacked you and persecuted you and they feel judged? What we're trying to do is be loving and gracious and give them the good news of the gospel, but all they see is the fact that they're sinners and they don't want to deal with it. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, you know, when you go into a household and you share the gospel... Some people will accept it. But for those households that don't, shake off the dust, leave. Now, it doesn't mean we condemn them, right? We know that Jesus alone is the judge. Share the gospel, and if they want nothing to do with it, leave in sorrow. Continue to pray for them, but recognize that we need to stay on mission. Well, that's our passage. That's the teaching on judgment. What do we learn? That Jesus is the the true judge. It's not our job to condemn other people, to be harsh, to be overly critical. We've learned that we need to self-assess before we speak into the life of somebody else. Ask God to show us our sinfulness, that we're not hypocrites. And then finally, realize, use discernment and know that regardless of how loving and gracious we are as we present the gospel, there will be some people who just reject it. Pray for them, but stay on mission and allow Jesus Christ to be the one to judge. We're going to go back to worship, and then I'll return with just a final word of encouragement.
Spirit, help my soul to
It was a joy to be with you this morning. I hope you enjoyed our time of worship together and our study of Matthew chapter 7. May we keep in mind that Jesus alone is the true judge. He is fit to judge, not us. I pray this week that as we find ourselves being harsh or critical of other people, that we stop, just stop. And if it's something that we know we shouldn't say, that we would just be quiet. And as God gives you a burden and a love for brothers and sisters in Christ, and you feel like you want to lovingly and humbly speak into their life, boy, we make sure that we stop and assess our own hearts first to make sure that the things that we're noticing in others are not, in fact, true of us first. We don't want to be a hypocrite. And then stay on mission. Continue to share the gospel. Love people well. God bless you. Have a great week.